This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. Hello and welcome to this study. We're going to be looking at 1 John today. So, uh, so far in this study series I've been working consecutively through the Gospel of John. And in the early days I envisioned that I would work through the New Testament gradually and consecutively. However, because it takes such a long time to produce all these slides and the recordings, and I've had other commitments, it's, I've been working my way through it quite slowly. So uh, I decided to pause John's Gospel for a bit and look into uh, the letter of 1 John, because I've had questions from multiple people lately about this epistle, particularly from chapter 3, actually, which is the, the he who commits sin is of the devil. So I've decided, you know, just to pause John's Gospel in the series for a bit so that we can focus on this epistle and then I can carry on uh, where I left off in, in John's Gospel. Now, arguably, you might disagree, but um, I think John's first epistle is probably one of the most difficult books in the New Testament to understand for, for several reasons. Now, first and foremost, that the language it is not particularly difficult in of itself. But across different verses and on the surface of things, it looks as if he makes some seemingly contradictory statements or he undermines or convolutes his own point. So, for example, in one verse, being born of God is simply based on believing in Christ. And yet in another verse, it's equated with loving one another. And yet in another verse, it's he who does not commit sin. Uh, some of his points seem as if they are underexplained, as if the verse needs a lot more context or information to understand what it means rather than what John actually provides. So, for example, what what is the sin that does or does not lead to death? Uh, this could be interpreted in all sorts of ways, and so it seems as if John leaves us in the dark about what that actually means. And he swings back and forth uh, between subjects. Now, uh, the way that Paul writes is a bit more linear. You know, he moves from one topic to another to another, and it's quite easy to see the flow of the letter. Whereas John's epistle is really bouncing back and forth between subjects. So he's talking about various commandments, then he's talking about Antichrist, then he's talking about righteousness, then loving one another, then he's talking about Antichrist again, then he's talking about loving one another again, and then he's talking about commandments again, and righteousness again, and so on and so on. So there's a lot more bouncing around um, in his epistle. Um, now this, is, this epistle is an important go-to passage for legalists to promote a work's salvation. Despite the book having five chapters, uh, there's two or three verses in the third chapter that, that are quote mind and, and cherry pick like clockwork to say that salvation must include being sinless or at least not having a lifestyle uh, practice of sin. Um, differences in, in different Bible translations can also cause issue there as well. Uh, and 1 John 3 is the sinless perfectionist's favourite part of the Bible really. It's, they will inevitably go there uh, fairly quickly. And uh, many brethren who, who are saved by grace struggle to understand or under, uh, you know answer chapter 3 and, and may easily be disturbed by uh, how legalists interpret it, not knowing how to combat their arguments or, or not considering other possible uh, interpretations and whether you know what, what the alternatives are. Uh, now, if you have followed my study on uh, John 14 and 15, then you will know that John's epistle borrows a lot of the same language and themes from his gospel. So uh, John uses a lot of the same lingo that Jesus uses in John 14 and 15 in his epistles. Uh, some of his statements are almost exactly like what, what Jesus said to him even. And just as John 14 and 15 are, are difficult chapters to understand, and it took me several hours to, to really go through that just be, because it's so difficult. So therefore, you know, John's first epistle is somewhat challenging as well. Um, it's It's very doctrinally heavy and deep rather than practical uh, rather like the book of hebrews perhaps in that respect whereas paul's epistles are perhaps semi-doctrinal and semi-practical and, and james's book is perhaps doctrine like but but very very practical uh, john makes a lot of uh, doctrinal statements but doesn't give a lot of practical advice so for example john tells us to uh, love one another in deeds and that loving one another is a sign that we are, are born from god in, in, a, in a manner of speaking but he doesn't give us a list of practical loving deeds that we can actually do to, to demonstrate love for one another nor does he go into great detail about what happens if we we don't do these things or the implication of being born of god and yet not not doing these works to show love towards the brethren okay uh, you may have heard a lot of Christians, what, whatever their soteriology, soteriology is, uh, claim that the, the first epistle of John was written to warn 
Christians about Gnostics. Um, believers in grace would say that the Gnostics denied that they were sinners in need of a saviour. And so John was warning against their false beliefs. And that, that's that's the lens through which they will see verses such as 1 John 1 9, if we, if we confess our sins. And then Christians trusting in works would say that the Gnostics did not live in obedience and would not turn from sins. And so John was warning against their licentiousness. And so that's the lens through which they will see verses such as 1 John uh, 3 8, he that commits sin is of the devil. Now, I disagree with that entire premise. Uh, I believe that it is entirely conjectural uh, for these reasons. First of all, we, we don't know when John actually wrote this letter, whether it's written before or after Gnosticism became a wide issue or a, a named heresy with an ism to describe it. Uh, quite noteworthy is that sometimes the Bible gives a particular voice to people or groups uh, that were the cause of heresy, such as the, the Nicolaitans. Uh, this epistle does not give such a voice, though. It, it only describes a, a very generic type of person really called Antichrists without pinning on that label on anybody other than those who, who deny that, that Jesus is the Christ or that he has come in the flesh, which is quite specific, really. Um, and important as well, if we, if we allow the Bible to be self-sufficient and self-contained, the most troubling group of people for denying that Jesus is the Christ was really the Jews who, who sought to kill Jesus for his claims about himself. This was quite a repetitive theme throughout the Gospels. Um, in John 8, we see Jesus warning the Pharisees that they would die in their sins for not believing that I am he. That's the 8.24. And being the seed of Abraham uh, would not give them any exemption to this. And, and in the same chapter, we also see a very similar statement Then in, in 1 John 3, 8, uh, he who commits sin is of the devil, which is very similar to he who commits sin is the servant of sin from John's Gospel. So there's obviously striking links there between the two. Um, in John 9, we see Pharisees uh, rebuking the healed blind man for being born in sin, yet trying to lecture them, uh, giving an indication that the Jews and Pharisees didn't recognise themselves as sinners in need of saving, perhaps on account of being the seed of Abraham, as per the previous chapter. And so if we piece together those above points, I would assert that, the, that John's first epistle is intended to deal with Perhaps you might say the Christian mentality versus the, the Jewish mentality issue, rather than weird teachings about Gnosticism. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and, and really, denying that Jesus is the Christ or that He came in the flesh is barely the beginning of all the, the weird things that the, the Gnostics uh, apparently or supposedly believed. So in this study then, um, although chapter 3 is where a lot of Christians struggle, we, we can't delve into chapter 3 until we have some understanding and context from chapters 1 and 2 first. So in this first study, we're going to focus on chapter 1 and also the first uh, two verses of chapter 2, and then the following chapters just have to wait for their own uh, separate study, I'm afraid. Okay. So let's introduce our reading then. So from verse 1, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was it with the Father, and was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write I unto you, that your joy may be full. And so, um, unlike Paul's epistle, or even John's other epistles really, this one doesn't have a very personal introduction, it doesn't give a clear indication of who the letter is from, or, or the target audience to, to whom it's being addressed. So he starts his letter by introducing who Christ is, and his role in, in, giving, in the giving of eternal life. So eternal life does clearly have an important application in his letter, which is, is perhaps why it's so difficult. We, we can't just completely dismiss it as, say, being about fellowship and discipleship only. We, we do have to consider um, whether there are any, any implications on our salvation um, in this epistle, because it, it does talk about it quite extensively. Okay, So uh, John declares what we have seen, Okay, uh, I've put that in quotes there, with the intent that the readers may have fellowship with him and the, the people that, that he represents in this we there, and that his fellowship is also with, with the Father and, and Jesus the Christ. Okay, so it's not made very obvious who John means by we. Um, it's collective language that not only represents himself, but other people that he's representing. So this could be the apostles or it could be the brethren generally speaking. 
Uh, it's possible that John was writing to some people on behalf of the apostles. It's possible that John was writing on behalf of some brethren who perhaps had seen the Christ in person. Uh, you know, we have seen and do declare. But then he's writing to other brethren whom he has uh, converted, who, who know the truth, but may have not actually seen Christ uh, in person. Okay, And as the epistle progresses, the, the we and our becomes more inclusive of the people that John is writing to. So uh, in verse 4, and also in several verses throughout the second chapter, John gives us explicit reasons as to why he is writing, i.e. The, the purpose of the letter, okay, that your joy may be full, okay, that your sins are forgiven for his namesake, that you, you know him that is from the beginning, you have overcome the wicked one, you have known the Father, you are strong, the word of God abides in you, concerning them that seduce you. So this uh, epistle is intended to exhort and encourage brethren who are already saved okay it's it's addressed to people who already know the truth at least to a sufficient extent another observation is that verse 4 is very similar to what john said uh, sorry what jesus said to john in john 15:11 so jesus said to john these things have i spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full and john is likewise saying that your joy might be full and so we see that having joy is meant to be an important purpose of John's epistle. And I explained, if you've already watched my John 15 and John 14 study, that how legalists take letters and passages that are intended to be an encouragement and somehow turn them into a dire warning. Okay, John's epistle picks up some very similar themes, uh, such as loving one another, keeping my commandments, abiding. So the, there are some encouraging aspects to what he's writing about, but you know, people always want to make it about the, the hammer coming down. Okay, so that's the uh, the introduction. The next thing then is to look at uh, what it means to walk in the light. There is potential to misunderstand or misappropriate what that actually means, as you can imagine a lot of people would say that this has something to do with turning from our sins, especially because the, the later verses in the chapter are about sin. Um, a lot of people may confuse this with walking in the spirit as well as if they are the same thing. Um, so let's uh, read the rest of the chapter then. So uh, from verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay. So John is declaring a message to his recipients here in verse 5. And this is uh, a common theme perhaps in the epistle as John will later talk about uh, receiving the witness. Uh, or this is the message you have received. He that believes in the Son has witness. Okay, so there's a lot of themes around declaration, witness, that, that which is true and acknowledging it. Uh, the declaration being made that God is light as opposed to darkness. And so we have to walk in this light which is God, right? And so uh, this is important then. In the last uh, verse of the chapter, there is a lot of importance placed on what we say or what we confess in relation to which category we actually uh, fit in. So we're, we're going to explore that as well in this study. Okay. Now, this is important because many uh, legalists will uh, misappropriate verses from John's epistle and, and make it all about your works. And they will presume that because it uses terminology such as keeping his commandments, that, that it's all about sin and it's all about turning from your sin. But the most explicit verses about eternal life in the epistle actually relate really to what one believes um, and the, the testimony of what one believes. And, and following the commandments follows this, but it doesn't, it doesn't precede it, though. Now, if you followed my study on John 14 and 15, you ought to remember how we related in that study what Jesus said to John and then what John said in his epistles to see how John interpreted what commandments Jesus was actually talking about. And it really had more to do with keeping the doctrine of Christ and continuing in his teachings, his words, and, you know, as well, loving others that are born of God, rather than every micro sort of moral issue that Jesus ever gave to anybody anywhere. Okay. Likewise, in John's epistle, we will see the importance of faith being emphasised is believing in the you could call it the right Jesus, I suppose. Well, he doesn't use that terminology, obviously. But he does lay out some important points about, about who Jesus is and what he has done. And so the Antichrist that he describes 
are the people who deny such truth about Jesus. They're not people that are believing all the right stuff, but doing all the wrong things, okay? They, they deny fundamental truths about who Jesus is. This may not be very obvious now, but you'll, you'll recognise it more and more as we progress through this epistle in this study and, and the upcoming study videos as well when I get those released, okay? Uh, but the reason I'm, I'm giving you these spoilers is because it's, it's somewhat important to understanding what walking in the light actually means. First, uh, let's, let's spend a moment digressing away from one jump for a bit, and let's look cross-biblically about what walking in the light may mean in other passages, just to see if we can get a bit more context about it. Okay, now, uh, one little caveat to this is that walking and light are common biblical words and concepts, uh, each word appearing in the Bible dozens of times and used in many different ways, because they're such common words, right? So ju just because they, they won't always mean the same thing or apply in the same way every time those uh, words are used to make a point okay so like what, what you could say is for example walking in the light is not necessarily the same thing as walking in the spirit there's a reason why john and paul use different terms and they're talking about different subjects okay see this is how how you divide the word of god right shining the light on the darkness again is not necessarily exactly the same thing as walking in the light per se because the saying is used in a different way so just because the bible uses the word light or uses the word what it doesn't mean that that passage always defines what it means here necessarily okay that's my point the most obvious place to start would be john's gospel seeing as john's epistle echoes many themes and terminology that jesus used in his, his gospel account right and we've already seen examples of that so in john chapter 8 verse 12 uh, jesus specifies the criteria for having the light and not walking in darkness okay uh, very similar to 1 John where John declares that God is light after already describing that Jesus is the word of life, okay? However, just like walking in the light, we need some context as to what following me in this verse actually means. Is it about following him in works or is it about following him in faith? Well, the next verses tell you, you just read the next couple of verses. Pharisees did not try to defend their own works or their own obedience. Neither did they challenge Jesus' works or obedience to the law, although they did not the passages. Rather, when Jesus said, follow me and you shall have the light, they, they challenged Jesus' declaration about who he is, okay? So they're challenging the record, they're challenging the declaration, okay? This is what you confess, this is what you believe, right? Um, and then later, he, he specifies as well, if, if uh, you shall die in your sins, because you don't believe that I am he, all right? It's not, well, you shall die in your sins because you believe that I am he, but you won't clean your life up. No, you won't believe that I am he. That's why you will die in your sins. And so that defines what he means by following him for the light of life in that context, right? Believe him, believe the, the record who he is, okay? Believe the record that he is testifying about himself. So John 8, uh, where Jesus was talking about the record of who he is as the Son of God, while the Pharisees challenged and denied this record, and even tried to kill him for declaring that record. This is very similar to what John says in his first epistle. He will warn us about the Antichrists that deny important tenets about Jesus. He will exhort his readers to abide in the, the word, quote-unquote, that was given uh, onto them at the beginning okay we'll, we'll look at that you know later in the series in chapter five particularly he will talk about bearing record bearing witness and believing in this witness and deny denouncing the faith of one who denies that witness okay so you see how this is sort of swinging the balance more in favor about what you actually believe rather than what you do or at least so far anyway so then let's uh, have a look at John 11 as well. Let's just fast forward a couple of chapters. And so uh, we see the statement, if any man walk in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if, if a man walks in the night, he stumbles because there's no light, right? And so that's obviously somewhat slightly obvious, but Jesus is using the analogy in more of a practical sense, I suppose. Um, so although the analogy is very obvious in of itself, how Jesus uses this analogy may help us to understand the point. And so immediately before Jesus said that, the disciples, uh, he tells his disciples he's going up to Judea and they don't quite understand why because the, the Jews are seeking to kill him there, right? But then immediately after he explains, walking in the light, uh, he talks about Lazarus sleeping and and you would think that that's kind of unrelated to that, right? You, you, you wouldn't necessarily see the connection. So Jesus is drawing attention to the immediate uh, thing at hand rather than something that, that perhaps is less important. Okay. 
So um, the, it, it's quite difficult to say with certainty what John meant. Uh, sorry, what Jesus meant in John eleven, because it's quite a cryptic answer given the surrounding context. So you, you could just look at it at a practical application. When Jesus goes to Judea, specifically Jerusalem, the Jews will not seek to kill him during the day, right? And because Jesus was able to foresee when his time would come, he he, he would know that he can wander Judea safely uh, and and when to go into hiding, right? And furthermore, Jesus was captured during the night when he sent Judas out. So, you know, he premeditated his betrayal. So, so he knows that when they go about the day, they will be okay, right? That's the, the practical answer, if you like. A more spiritual application is to link it to Lazarus, that he must go and heal Lazarus, to the end being that he would build up the faith of Mary, Martha, and his disciples. Now, Jesus is actually withholding Lazarus from being healed, if, if you're familiar with the story. Uh, rather, he will die, but then he will be resurrected. And in doing so, uh, he will um, he will declare being the resurrection, and it was to the intent that they would believe. Okay, So this is it's a very cryptic from this point of view, but we once again see, though, that the goal is... It was that the audience would believe him and you know who he is, the life and the resurrection. Okay, and I, you know I've dealt with that passage earlier in the series. And then uh, fast forward to John twelve. So we see that there is a, a limited amount of time for this audience that he's talking to here, and the, these are um, Greeks that, that, that seem to observe all the Jewish ordinances. Though, now uh, I haven't really done more uh, notes on this really uh, in the PowerPoint, but obviously if you remember the. Um, passage G, the, this crowd had seen jesus miracles but they still wouldn't receive him and, and it, it referred back to isaiah and, and so on and so that the problem with this crowd is that despite seeing miracles they wouldn't believe that he is he okay they wouldn't really grasp what, what he was saying and so it, again it's really more to do with their belief rather than their works specifically so thus far we've seen a repetitive theme in John's Gospel, that, that walking in the light is synonymous with believing in it, uh, that is to, to believe on Christ. Now there are a, a few other references to walking in the light or something similar, but I, I think they are red herrings for the purpose of this study. So in Revelation 21-24, the nations of the saved walk in the light of the new heavenly city, but this doesn't really seem appropriate for the application of 1 John. Isaiah 2.5 talks about walking the light of the Lord, but arguably it has end times applications. So again, perhaps not appropriate. You've got Psalm 89.15, but it's quite poetic and maybe has a, a different meaning. And so I don't think it really clearly defines it for us here. Uh, the last reference, which may or may not be helpful, is perhaps that I've got is in Ephesians. So in Ephesians 5.8.9, it says, You were sometimes darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children uh, of light. Now, unlike the Gospel of John... Uh, Ephesians 5 is not an instruction of how to be saved. Paul's audience were, in the past, darkness, but are now, in the present, light. So this, this passage does presuppose that this is a saved audience. So in a way, they're already in the light. Okay, so arguably, this passage is perhaps more works orientated. It is perhaps more about what you do rather than what you believe because a key theme is separating yourself from joining in the behavior of the children of disobedience. But Ephesians 5 is a bit different from John's Gospel because it's, it's not about believing in the light. That's already happened for the Ephesian audience because they are children of the light, right? They've already been adopted into that light. And so they're not told to walk in the light, rather they're told to walk as children of the light. So the way that it's used is a little bit different. But the key dif difference between Ephesians 5 and 1 John is that Paul actually gives practical advice as to what it means to walk as children in the light in the surrounding verses. Whereas 1 John isn't very heavy on the practicals. The, the, the upcoming verses really will define what walk, you know, walking in the light very differently as to the kinds of things that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians. So returning to John's epistle then, we start to see the crux of the matter what's going on here. John gives us two types of people, okay? There are two categories of person. Very important that you understand that, because I've talked about this in the series before, how the Bible frequently gives us two types of people, right? They who are and they who aren't, or they who do and they who don't. But then with conditional security and work salvation, we kind of invent this third person that's simultaneously doing both. But there's two types of people here. So if we walk in darkness, we do not, and I use I'm putting this in quotes, do the truth, because obviously it doesn't say believe the truth. We can say that we have fellowship with him, but this is lying, it's not it's not the truth. On the other hand, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship that we say we have, not only with Christ, but with one another, and the blood of Christ 
cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so they're the two options here. Now, this is quite important, is that in the latter verses here, what we say or what we confess is an important determining factor as to which group we actually fit in, whether we be the ones cleansed from sin or deceived and not doing the truth, right? Very important that you understand that and that, that will make more sense. So what? let's just get a few things going on here that John uses collective language most of the time anyway. He, he's not saying if any man walk in the light or if you walk in the light or if thou walk in the light. He's using inclusive language that includes the recipients of the people that John represents. So a big part of what John is saying here, I believe, has to do with how we as a collective body of Christ, if you like, perceive ourselves and perceive each other. What we collectively say and confess. So it's not just about what I personally say and confess, but you and me as brothers, if we're brothers in Christ, what we both together confess or say, okay? Uh, in verse 6, not having fellowship with him is contrasted with having fellowship with one another. So having fellowship with Christ automatically really comes in the exact same territories having fellowship with those who are born of Christ, right? If, if I have fellowship with Christ, I have fellowship with you if you are also fellowshipping with Christ, yeah? So there has to be some degree of unity around how the brethren walk in the light and, and do the truth, okay? Now, uh, as you probably know some people will pick up on this fact that it says do the truth okay and of course legalists will love that because they insist then that there's all these works of obedience that you actually have to do it's not just what you believe because it's you know it's a it's a do word but really the, the surrounding context of the passage doesn't fit this interpretation because you know as i mentioned earlier john isn't giving a practical list of works here he starts with verse 5 with a declaration of the message and he will go on to say after verse 7 if we say that if we confess that if we say that okay so the surrounding context would suggest that walking in the light is about what we collectively as brethren believe about jesus and believe about ourselves so do you could say that doing the truth is not just believing general facts about jesus that is the christ etc but also the doctrine about what we believe about ourselves and our sins in relation to the Christ. And that will that will hopefully make more sense as as the study progresses, right? Because if if we let's just say I'm I'll explain this verbally, but let's just say we've got two people, right? They they both believe that Jesus is the Christ, or they both profess that, but one person says, I have no sin, and the other person says, I have sin, right? That you see how they they both believe one thing about the Christ, but then there's something else where they're believing opposite things. Well, one of them's doing the truth and one of them isn't, right? And so that's really what's being being dealt with here, if that helps. So um, verses eight to ten are very helpful because what we say or what we confess is the the division between which group of the people we fit in, right? On the one hand, if we say that we have no sin and we have not sinned, well, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We make him a liar. His word is not in us. So applying this to the earlier verses, then, we would assume that this exact same category of person walks in darkness, lies and does not do the truth, right? Say that we have fellowship with him, but, it, but it, it's not true. On the other hand, the opposite of that, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So applying this to the early verses, we would assume that this same category of people walk in the light as he is in the light, have fellowship with one another. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And notice how verses 7 and 9 have synonymous uh, endings. Yeah. So following this, then, we can continue to make a division between the truth and the lie elsewhere in John's epistle. If we, or if any man keeps not his commandments or on the other hand keeps his words or hates his brother or loves his brother or denies that jesus is the christ and denies the son or acknowledges the son believes not and has made god a liar or believes on the son and has witness so there are other divisions in the epistle as well for example does righteousness or commit sin in chapter three but uh, these verses are perhaps not directly true tied with truth versus lie per se but you know again that will be addressed um, in in future studies so let's, let's just try to illustrate this visually, how one must walk in light. And again, we, we've got this we collective language. So these guys over here, they say, well, we have no sin, we have not sinned, right? Whereas these guys over here, we confess our sins. And so really, when we illustrate it, it's quite simple. The blood of Christ cleanses them from all sins. He is faithful and just to forgive them. 
they deceive themselves that the truth is not in them they make jesus a liar okay so in conclusion we we clearly see that walking in the light is about what we believe and what we confess or say not just about what any one person believes but rather what we as brethren collectively believe because what we say or what we confess or walk in determines whether we have fellowship with god and with one another or or not okay now although it's not strictly about works in a, in, its, in its context there is more that we need to look at in verses 8 to 10 because these verses are definitely about sin and so how different people interpret them particularly when you've got easy believism and sinless perfectionism at complete opposite ends of the spectrum here they, they have to have very different conclusions about these verses okay so we're going to have to spend quite a lot of time on this but there's a few things that need to be addressed here when it says if we say that we have no sin right we deceive ourselves so obviously we we have to ask the question how would sinless perfectionists or perhaps lordshippers interpret verse 8 because obviously it's in the present tense okay so they've got to conjure up an answer for that we also need to look at verse 9 when it says confess our sins because what needs to be answered because I, this is perhaps where there's been a lot of mixtures of answers what exactly it means by confession in verse 9 now you might have realized that i've perhaps already thrown hints about what it actually means um in the previous slides but does it mean confession before each other or you know as brethren or does it mean confession before god does it mean confession in, in like the catholic sense or does it mean confession just of the heart or of the mouth is it a one-off confession like when they confess their sins at john's baptism or is it an ongoing confession of some kind um verse 10 is less controversial because whatever spectrum of christians you know we, we don't typically in, differ on how we interpret verse 10 verse 10 isn't a stumbling block for us it's obviously believing that we have sinned is christianity 101 and we're, both easy believists and sinless perfectionists can all agree that people who don't believe that they have sinned are apostate if they're christian okay you know even even some of the worst heretics in christianity acknowledge that we have sinned okay but in, in john's time this this may have been a stumbling block for many jews for, for reasons that i proposed earlier and and today also you know with the modern church many uh well, i've heard it described as neo-evangelicals the modernist church the liberal church if you like they, they also have very diluted views about sin okay and also um although I've, I've really already spoken about this who is we because so far in our study evidence points us towards thinking that it's about john and the recipients of his letter and, and the people who on, on behalf of who he's writing so we would say that it's about us it's about the brethren it's about saints it's about christians but then many people would interpret it particularly in verse 9 to be about any one person or about unbelievers that it's if, if when it says if we confess in that's about an unsaved individual person getting saved or, or needing to be saved so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well okay now uh to me personally i think the first chapter break in this epistle is somewhat unnatural um obviously john didn't write the chapter numbers so it, it would help just to read a little bit into chapter two just for a bit more context so uh, in verses one and two my little children these things i write unto you that you sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also the sins of the whole world so john gives us a purpose of this letter he's writing with the intention or to the intention that you or we don't sin that's why he's writing okay if you or if any one individual if any man fails the intentions of the letter he explains what happens we have an advocate okay you know we we have the, the propitiation if you like now interestingly although these verses do give us more context they do also add more complexity into our investigation because of the change in collective in individual language because up and net up until now john has used either we or our or you and you which is plural okay it's not not the and thou but then if an offense is committed against his intentions that, that someone you know that someone sins when he wrote to them that they would not sin all of a sudden it's now if any man rather than if we sin but then the remedy to this one man's offense is again collectively it's not to this any man so you know he could have said if we sin we have an advocate or he could have said if any man sin that man have an advocate he didn't say that okay so you know people might play tricks with that uh, you might you might ask why it matters well it only matters because of how a sinless perfectionist might interpret it because they perceive that, that somebody who sins 
forfeits their salvation and is a false believer, they could try and trap you with the pronouns, saying that if any man, he, that one person, is cut off and loses salvation, but but we, the true saints who don't sin, we still have the advocate, we still um, have the propitiation. So uh, let's let's review how they're interpreting um, these verses. Okay. So to, to help illustrate this, I, I've given you kind of a, a scale, if you like, to see how we can interpret well perceive how these verses have been interpreted so save through faith with works this is the, the sinless perfection end of the spectrum based on the latter passages in chapter three you have to be absolutely sinless to be saved right and so they will say then that 1 john 1 8 to 2 2 is about sinners repenting of their sins and, and turning from it until they have fully surrendered or however they will phrase it on the other hand, on the other extreme of the spectrum, you've got saved through faith without works, and that's what the Bible calls grace, okay? God has, and, and people will say, people often say this, that God has forgiven all sins, past, present, and future, and for as long as you still live in this body of the flesh, you're always going to sin. And therefore, according to 1 John 8 and 2 to 2, we, we acknowledge this, so we believe on Jesus. That That's how they will often interpret it on, on the, the faith alone side. In the middle, with the lordship salvation is kind of like saved through a true faith alone that will produce to produce works you know it's like one foot in there one foot in there based on the later passages in chapter three there, there needs to be some evidence of changed life to be saved but it, it doesn't mean perfection so one john is kind of like acknowledging when we sin god for, god is faithful to forgive as long as there isn't a lifestyle of sin and so that that's how they will interpret it okay so where do they get their interpretations from well Verse 8 is really problematic to a sinless perfectionist, so they, they have to assume that it essentially means the same thing as it does in verse 10, that, that you are denying that you have past sins that you need saving from. So it, it doesn't mean that you have present sins because that would contradict other verses in John, supposedly. So they really just say that verse 8 is just the same thing as verse 10, just said in a different way. Uh, and that they will use verse 6 preceding it to set the context for it because if, if we are not in the truth we, we walk in darkness quote unquote so verse 8 cannot mean that a saved christian continues in sin in the present tense because that would contradict walking in darkness in verse 6 right uh, now using a, a non-kgb translation um they will insist that verses such as 1 john 3 8 are outright proof that a save, saved believer should not be continuing in sin so the idea that a christian is always going to sin um, based on 1.8 is quoting it out of context and in, in ignorance to um, sorry I forgot to complete that sentence for some reason but in, in this one and there is a bit of a thing about how this says practice of sin the King James doesn't say that but that'll have to wait to chapter 3 so um, I looked around at how sinless perfectionists answered this and so the, these are a few of the things that I found so this guy is you know hardcore term for me sins to be saved so uh, he says essentially uh, verse 6, if we continue in darkness, this proves that verse 8 does not mean continued present sin because we, we can't be walking in darkness. Okay. In 2 John 2, 18-19, we have these antichrists that went out from us. Well, this shows that the epistle was written about the Gnostics and they had all kinds of heretical teachings. And uh, further qualified in 1 John 4, 1-3, where it says, test the spirits, you can clearly see that he is addressing the Gnostics, right? And supposedly the Gnostics claim that they didn't have any sin. Uh, he also says, uh, and this is obviously true, that if you, it's a letter. So if you take out the chapters and numbers, read it in the flow of a letter. Obviously the chapters and numbers weren't there when John wrote it. So that, that's some of the points that he's made about it. Now, uh, this guy, Dan Mowley, you wouldn't normally think that they belong in the same camp because you might not actually realise that he's a sinless perfectionist because he's really more about um, identity kind of a gospel which is something that he would refute but um i think he, he does really kind of believe it it's just he says it in a very nice way and uh, a much more gentle way than most people and he kind of says it without saying it really so it's maybe not obvious that he's a sinless perfectionist but you know he believes that essentially you're walking in a new identity and your new identity is that you don't sin so 
verse 7 if we walk in the light and, and he'll embellish that to say if we come clean come free from ourselves get in true fellowship with him and it cleanses from all sin uh, righteousness it's done so uh, we're not dual natured we're not driven by sin not desperately in need of the blood every single day not oh thank you god i'm always going to sin but he forgives me so so he's he's refuting that kind of a mentality yeah and so um being cleansed from all sin that that means all our sin which he would uh, although he doesn't say this it, it seems like he's saying that it includes your propensity to even sin that's completely removed so even your desire to sin essentially is removed he's it, kind of saying it without saying it really so in the context of verse 7 verse 8 if we say we have no sin he he interprets that as meaning if you say you have no need for the blood so it, it doesn't mean if you sinned today it just means do you recognize that you need jesus so the person who says i have no sin he's basically basically saying i don't need to be born again i don't need jesus i'm a pretty good person that that's how he's defining that so in verse 9 when it says if we confess our sins it, it doesn't interpret this to mean that we're always going to have sin but if we stumble then the light of my life reveals that recognizes that it wasn't god and my mindset was selfish and i get convicted etc so i say father so this is what i mean about the identity thing where it's just like proclaiming truth over yourself essentially and that that's how you get around the sin issue apparently um, this guy, One Reality, again, hardcore work, salvation, come, comes right out and says it. Um, Christians read this, he will say that Christians read this with a mentality that they're always going to sin till the day they die. Sorry, I've spelled that wrong. And this is why pastors so apparently molest children or are cheating on their wives and Christians think that they have to deliberately sin to be in the truth. I've never heard anybody say that, but that's what he's saying. Uh, John is writing to Gnostics, there it is again, who, who think that they have not sin, sinned since birth and wouldn't need Jesus, who are converting over to Christianity. Not sure why, but that's what he says. Uh, John does not address believers until chapter 2, supposedly. So in verse 9, we confess that we have sinned and we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, so we cannot have sin, present tense, according to verse 8. So, uh, in essence, then, this passage is about an unsaved person getting saved, that they will confess their sin and, in his words, repent of their sin and get saved. So that, that's how he's interpreting it, okay? Um, Jesse Morrell, so uh, I've put the videos in the video titles in there if you want to check these out, but uh, he'll say that a lot of Christians use this to attack holiness preaching. I don't know who, but that's what he says. John was writing against the Gnostics who believed that the flesh was a sinful substance and that you could never be free from sin until you die and you're released from the body. Uh, walking in darkness, verse 6, is walking in sin and wa walking in unrighteousness, not walking in the truth. So it's also important to note that he interprets cleansing from all sin as referring to in this life and it means that you no longer have the propensity to go out and sin that the savior cleanses from all sin is, is not death as the the gnostics taught uh, now this is noteworthy what he said that if somebody commits a sin such as fornication but then they claim they're not being sinful this is the kind of person that the passage is talking about uh, he also says as well that a lot of people interpret the Bible based on t today's debates like Calvinism versus Arminianism rather than the issues of the time and the, the audience of, it, of its day. Okay, so, we're, you know, we're maybe misunderstanding the argument because we're looking at it from, you know, modern argument points. Um, so he says that the whole point of telling you to confess your sin is that you get forgiven and cleansed and don't continue in sin, by which, he, you know, Jesse Morrell means repent of it, stop doing it altogether. Uh, noteworthy as well is that according to 1 John 2 1 it says if any man sin that means it's possible to sin but it's also possible to stop sinning because he wrote the epistle that you would not sin uh, he does also point out another uh, false extreme that, that some sinless perfectionists say it is impossible for a saved person to um, sin and uh, this is exactly what Mike Rakowski believes the next guy that uh, he, he does believe that he's at a point where he cannot he, he can't even choose to sin it's impossible for him to sin essentially so uh, basically what he says everyone on this earth except jesus was born in sin that does not mean we will always continue in sin there are no scriptures that say well he, he always says relate he has some weird obsession with using that word that we will always continue in sin or that we can never stop sinning the, the bible never says this supposedly um 
people who do not possess the Holy Spirit want to justify why they continue in sin. So when it says, if we say we have no sin, it, it does not apply to his own claim that he does not sin anymore because he confesses that he was born in sin and for 50 years of his life he lived in sin. He then confessed his sins and so he stopped living in sin. So again, it's this, it's about unbelievers getting saved in, in you know, in long story short. He then quotes a later verse from John that whos uh, whosoever has be, uh, been born of God does not sin and he cannot sin because his seed remains in him and the wicked one uh, cannot touch you. So if you are allowing the Holy Spirit of God to guide you, you will not sin. Now additionally, uh, if you've not heard of this guy before, um, Rakowski's doctrine of overcoming sin also involves overcoming sickness. So if you get sick, it's because you sinned and, and sin and sickness come come from the devil. And it's later clarified in 1 John 3 that whosoever sins has not seen him and does not know him. So if you say you still sin, it's because you don't know God, don't have the Holy Spirit, have no idea who God is. You're the one that's living a lie. You are deceived. You are blaspheming the word of God. And so essentially he's saying that if you still sin, you are denying the power of God, essentially, is what he's saying there. So that was sinless perfectionism. What about the opposite end of the spectrum? Free grace, easy believism. Where do they get their interpretations from? So uh, verse 8 obviously is fine as a self-contained verse if we say that we have no sin in the present tense. So uh, free grace advocates would say that believers sin even to the day they die. So because this verse is in the present tense that there's no problem for uh, easy believers about what verse uh, 8 means. Now, verse 9 is surprisingly controversial among uh, free grace advocates because different people have interpreted it in very different ways. And some people have even reconsidered their interpretation. You might argue perhaps that how the word confess uh, is interpreted could be an issue there. Verse 10, again, not, not controversial. There's, there's no issue with verse 10. So uh, I'll give you an example of uh, things I've heard from other easy believers to say about this passage. So uh, initially, uh, Greg Jackson once did a video where he stated it was direct, directed at the Gnostics. And the Gnostics claimed they didn't have any sin. And so they needed to acknowledge that they were sinners who, who needed to trust in Christ. Um, some people have refuted him about this view, stating that it refers to believers. But he's declined this view because it would involve ongoing confession, such as in uh, Catholicism. And so that obviously that would be maintaining forgiveness as opposed to one-time forgiveness. Um, now, I think he, he did change his view, that he's, his view has changed and that to be more in agreement with the second guy, although they disagree on many other things, which I'm not going to get into. But um, destroying the works of the devil, uh, he said that uh, he disagrees that this verse is about believers as well, for much the same reasons as Greg. Although rather than saying it's about the Gnostics, he's saying that it refers to unbelievers generally who need to confess their sins in, in the John the Baptist sense, like, you know, the one-time confession conversion, because they've not yet believed the gospel. And when people have confronted him about the use of the pronoun we, because it says if we confess our sin, and obviously the, the context is believers, he, he likens it to... Um, I think there was a waitress in a restaurant saying, oh, what are we having today? But the waitress herself is not not eating, right? Um, and then Toronto Bible Study, he's uh, said that this passage, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I apologise to him if I'm wrong about his interpretation, but it refers to ongoing confession of sins to God, not not for salvation. So it's not something that you have to do to be saved, but something that maintains your earthly fellowship or relationship with God unless you can get chastised or perhaps disfellowshipped from the brethren or something like that. And so um, then there's Lordship Salvation. Now among Lordshippers, I didn't really find anything surprisingly different from what we've already seen. It's mainly a repetition of some of the same points. And so it's kind of a mishmash of the aforementioned points that, you know, the, the epistle was written to the Gnostics or because they reject sinless perfectionism, they will acknowledge the ongoing sins of believers, but at the same time, they'll still insist that walking in the light must warrant a change in lifestyle, uh, not making a, a practice of sin. So I didn't, I didn't really find anything new in that category to, to handpick for you. So there's a lot of different arguments going on here and, and quite a lot to unpack. So I'm going to have to break down and refute some of the arguments. I can't go into every micro thing that they've said for the sake of time. But um, just as a spoiler alert, I don't really agree with any of the aforementioned interpretations, including those by other easy believers and I'm not you know I'm not having a go at them or anything I just professionally disagree with them but I, I have previously considered 
Toronto Bible Studies interpretation and for a time I thought it was correct but then when I've studied it again I've kind of repented of that view and I'm using that word correctly by the way because uh, I've realised something very obvious that I missed the whole time and when I saw it I couldn't believe how obvious it was all of these conflicting interpretations explain why John's epistle is such a complicated book because the things that John is saying in these verses is not really complicated in of itself. He's using quite simple language and so it's amazing how so few words can cause so much conflict about what he means. The answer to this passage is actually quite simple and when I noticed it I felt rather silly that I missed it the whole time because it was always there and all we have to do is just think carefully about the way that John phrases it and the reason why he says certain things. That's all you have to do. You know, just think carefully about why he's saying it the way that he's saying it, right? So I'll try and pick some of the main arguments. I can't go through every micro argument, but uh, easy believists and sinless perfectionists alike have interpreted this epistle to be all about Gnosticism, but they've taken their own spin on what Gnostic doctrine John was actually refuting. So if we ask the sinless perfectionists who say that John was writing about the Gnostics, well, they say that the Gnostics lived in sin and wouldn't turn from sin, and so that was the issue that John needed to address. On the contrary, easy believists, who also say that this book was directed towards the Gnostics, denied that they had sin or that Jesus was the Christ, and so that was what one John addressed. So either one or both of these sides are picking and choosing the aspects of Gnostics to associate with this epistle so as to defend their own positions. And in some of their assertions about Gnostics are not really necessarily accurate or evident evident from the writings that we have about Gnostics. They're either cherry-picked or they're conjectural or, or just simply not true or relevant, really. Um, further building on this, you see, my biggest problem with this assertion is the lack of evidence within the Bible itself. John makes no mention of Gnostics or Gnosticism, uh, and we have uh, we have to rely on extra biblical sources and conjectural assumptions to come to this conclusion essentially now there's a lot of um, hearsay about this epistle that john wrote it quite late in his life even after the temple of jerusalem was destroyed but doesn't bother to mention it but scholars can only deduce that based on his writing style they don't really have any absolute proof uh, many scholars would deny that john even wrote the book so um john didn't really find it necessary to document anything particularly relevant to his time frame so in summary I, I reject the idea that it's targeted at Gnostics specifically because uh, you know I don't think that that sets the premise for the whole book because you you cannot establish that from the Bible itself it, you know somebody has to plant that idea into your head essentially now um, most of what we know about Gnostics as, as far as I'm aware comes from Against Heresies by Irenaeus. So I actually produced a video going through the book to debunk a claim that Osas was a Gnostic doctrine. The, the Gnostics really believed in all kinds of kooky, weird things, assuming that what Irenaeus said is actually true and not biased, uh, by the way. But um, they believed in all kinds of weird things. And so really, John writes his epistle, what he writes in his epistle barely scratches the surface of what Gnostics actually believed. And the Antichrist characteristics that John exposed were quite specific. So really, I would argue that his epistle is very inadequate if it was intended to address Gnostic teachings. To top this off, really, the Antichrist characteristics could easily be applied to the Jews of John's time, who also denied that Jesus is the Christ and, you know, also denied that they had sin. And Paul warned us about Judaizers in his epistles. Now, strictly speaking, John doesn't mention Jews in his epistle, right? But at least internally, the Bible would make a much better case for that claim and a more self-sufficient case than the Gnostics, okay, just from the self-sufficient internal evidence. And furthermore, as well as uh, I mentioned earlier in the study, sometimes the Bible does name certain people that were the cause of certain false doctrines, like the Nicolaitans, right? But John doesn't give us that in epistles, so we don't know that he was targeting a very specific group of, of heretics. So John just said, um, another argument then, this is quite a big one, a lot of the sinless perfectionists were saying this, that John just said, prior to verse 8, 9 and 10, walk in the light before saying, if we say we have no sin. So he is not talking about present tense ongoing sins. Now, I perceive that there are two problems with this argument. The first biggest problem is that it's really begging the question, that is to say, asserting the conclusion, because the sinless perfectionists 
have read that word that that phrase walk in the light and they've pre-decided that that's what walking in the light means well it says walk in the light so it means you don't sit well, it, well you've decided that that's what those four words mean okay you've made that assumption so really what they're doing is they're using a cryptic figure of speech like walk in the light to define a clear statement if we say we have no sin rather than taking the more obvious statement and applying it to the more cryptic one right which you know would make more sense well earlier in this study we already looked at what walking in the light means that if if we use other passages in the bible particularly in john mainly in john's gospel that use this same phrase walk in the light it's really used more to do with believing who christ is and believing in him not in living a new kind of a life okay that's how john's gospel defines it far more clearly so if john's borrowing terminology from his gospel in his epistle which we can see that he does it's really far more to do with what you believe not your works and so the closest works like passages that we have that are similar are like walking in the spirit not walking in the light though or walking as children of the light so you know john's gospel presents a better case for our interpretation that walking in the light is really the truth that you believe it's walking in the truth acknowledging what is true believing in what is true the second problem with this argument, okay, if we're to assert that the sinless perfectionist view is true, that walk in the light means not sinning, then really the way that the Holy Spirit moved John to speak makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because John wrote a sentence that contradicts his own salvation doctrine, right? Logically speaking, if a sinless perfectionist's view were true, that Jesus has to remove sins, not just the sins that they've done or the penalty for sins, but also the propensity to sin or, you know, the fact that they sin. And this is how we're going to define free from sin, that you're a person who doesn't sin anymore. Well, then John cannot say in the present tense, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves because it's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. It's if we say we have sin, we deceive ourselves. So we really accuse John of writing a nonsensical statement that doesn't even match what he's proclaiming about salvation if you just follow the logic right we've been set free from our sins that's how they interpret jesus cleansed from our sins we don't sin anymore we're not living in sin uh, you know we've been cleansed from all of our sins we don't have sin anymore oh by the way if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves what that 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 doesn't make sense with the soteriology that you're supposedly claiming then it's it's like you're making john contradict himself now verse 10 still makes perfect sense if we say we have not sinned that's fine we don't have a problem with verse 10 but they're making verse 8 say the same thing when john worded it in the present tense not as something that happened in the past okay the third argument then um that verse 9 and you know dan moeller said it this way but also easy believists have said this as well that confess <laughs> means to acknowledge our need for the blood so like like dan moller said it's about unbelievers getting saved uh, you know if we say we have no need for the blood that's what john really means by saying that but my answer to that really is very similar to our uh, to argument two like my my question would be if this is what john really meant why couldn't the holy spirit move john to say it in the way that he meant because really the verse ought to say if we say we have no passing then we deceive ourselves but that's not what he said he said if we say we have no sin present tense we deceive ourselves and then verse 9 ought to say if any man acknowledge his need for the blood of jesus he is faithful for it but again that's not how the holy spirit moved john to speak the holy spirit moved john to say if we confess that's an action present tense our sins he's faithful and just to forgive okay i am satisfied in my own mind you can disagree that's up to you but I think John is being deliberate in the language being used and that the Holy Spirit did not write him to move something that is deliberately confusing, okay? So, you know, I hope just looking at that right there, that table there of what John could have said versus what he did say would help you understand why I'm disagreeing with everybody here, okay? Um, argument number four is that John is talking about unbelievers. Verse 8 to 10 are not referring to saved people. They're about people who need to get saved. Now, um, as we saw with Gnosticism, both easy believists and sinless perfectionists alike are making this claim, but they've got their own spin on how it actually applies. Uh, you know, the sinless perfectionists will say that it means unbelievers need to repent of their sins. The easy believers say that unbelievers need to recognize that they are sinners. Once again, with argument two and three, we're accusing John and the Holy Spirit of using nonsensical language that doesn't make doctrinal sense. Okay, verse three and four 
quite clearly clarify who we are. Now, in poetry books like Psalms or Job or songs, obviously this is not as straightforward because the pronouns flip around all the time and it's poetry, right? But this ought to really be, this is an instructional letter, it ought to be more straightforward than that. Okay, no, no verse so far has redefined who we are, okay? We are the brethren, the people of God. So now, some will say it's a figure of speech, so I mentioned earlier that the waitress example, like a waitress comes up to you and say, well, oh, what are we having today? But the waitress is not uh, eating. Now, I can't accept that for the main reason that I find that view very conjectural. I find it unverifiable. Like, I, I can't verify that what you're saying is true. I've got no way of knowing that. I, I can only base it on your assumption, right? And really, I, I don't think you can compare informal speech in a restaurant with, with men speaking as they are moved by the Holy Ghost and wrote and carbon copied this letter, okay? So, you know, I, I'm not having a go at the people who have proclaimed that, you know, I'm not ripping on them all, but, you know, that I'm, I'm just professionally disagreeing with other, other easy believers about this. Uh, argument five is that it means to stop living in sin, and this is essentially how Jesse uh, Morell and Mike Rakowski interpret, well, I suppose all the sinless perfectionists did, really. But as, as with all the previous arguments, were doing the same thing again, accusing John of writing nonsensical language that contradicts his own theology. He should not be saying, if we say we have no sin, present tense, if we have been cleansed from our sins and we don't sin anymore and we don't sin because we're children of God and you all sin, but we don't. You know, you deceive that yourselves, we don't. John should not be saying that. It makes no sense with what he's actually talking about. And again, it, it's inserting the conclusion because what they're doing is they're reading the bit saying cleanses us from all sin and they think, well, that means you don't sin anymore. Well, the thing is that that's not what cleansing means, right? Cleansing, like another word for cleaning or, you know, scrubbing. Now, anybody who knows the first thing about cleaning knows that when you clean something, it eventually gets dirty, okay? Those of you that are clean freaks and like to clean your house, or maybe you're a housewife and you're looking after the family, you know that as soon as the kids and the husband come home, that house ain't as clean as you made it. Doesn't matter how much effort you put into it, it gets dirty very quickly, okay? The fact that it says cleanses us from all sin is not proof text that you don't sin anymore, okay? And they will, they will borrow from later passages about he who commits sin, he cannot sin. So, you know, they'll say, well, well, he who is born of God cannot sin, right? But then they believe in conditional security. So their own definition violates those later verses. Just, just think about it. If a saved believer who has been cleansed of sin, including their propensity to sin, can then choose to sin and lose their salvation, then by definition, your definition of it, they weren't cleansed. They weren't set free. Someone who was born of God can sin and become unborn. A person born of God can sin. So they contradict their own interpretation because they, they just talk out of both sides of the mouth. I can't unpack that now. I know that's the bit that people get stuck on and I know that's the verses that people find super hard to understand and I, you know, I will get to it. I intend on getting to it. But chapters three and five are just going to have to wait to their own study. Okay, we've, we've got to get through this. We've got to do this in order. Okay. So argument number six, then, this is saying that verse nine refers to fellowship, or, or you might say relationship, I guess. So a saved believer should confess their sins in, in prayer, presumably. Not for salvation. So, you know, it's got nothing to do with, says, what must I do to be saved? You know, you're still saved if you don't do it, but it's to stay in fellowship with God or with their brethren to stay in fellowship with them, such as to retain or, or recover church membership. Um, and often they'll, they'll say that fellowship is, is perhaps using it in the same way as discipleship, I guess. Um, I have previously considered this view, but really I have repented of holding this view because the, uh, what I've realised is that the problem here is really trying to define the word fellowship. Okay, Because the word fellowship is used a handful of times in the Bible and perhaps um, similar words are like relationship or, or brotherhood. And other passages use fellowship in like a gospel-like context, like Philemon 1.5. And so sometimes fellowship does seem like it's salvation relevant. Um, where Paul uses the word fellowship, he sometimes uses it as not associating with or participating in the needs of non-brethren and participating in things pertaining to the faith. Now, I've, I've not done like hours and hours and hours and hours of, you know, in-depth study about what fellowship means. But at a glance, you know, if you look at all the different verses where it means it more commonly seems to mean association with or participation so if, if we are in fellowship with brethren 
it's because we associate with one another you know usually over the doctrines we believe right and we associate with god and so we are commanded not to be in fellowship or, or not to participate in or associate with the works of darkness right so if we say that somebody is cut off from fellowship with god like my, my problem with that view is well what does that actually mean does it do you mean that god won't answer your prayer or do you mean that god will punish you and chastise you in a non hellfire kind of a way or and, and and then if if that's how you're interpreting it then the next question i have to ask is what verses in the bible define fellowship in this way okay and so there's really too much openness to what fellowship actually means if you're going to say that so to me this interpretation just leaves too many holes about what fellowship means and perhaps again we're asserting conclusions oh that's what fellowship means without really providing satisfactory proof to clearly define it and then apply it to what john is even talking about and furthermore if we just look at what we've been looking at that, that you know in this chapter the chastisement of a disobedient believer or the consequences of disfellowshipping is not something that this epistle is talking about okay so we're, we're just arbitrarily adding this definition when john himself didn't necessarily define it this way now if we were doing a study on perhaps one corinthians that might be a stronger argument but i think it, it's too weak in john's epistle because really what you believe about what it means is outside of the subject of John's epistle. It's, you're talking about something that John's not talking about, essentially. So with all of that, I see problems with all of the aforementioned interpretations. And obviously there's more I could have said on that, but I think you get the idea. So um, obviously then I need to provide justification as to what I believe it means. Now, as I've said repeatedly, John is using simple language. He's not using fancy word salad. It, it ought to be fairly simple to understand what John really means, and I believe it is. And when I recognised it, I was surprised at actually how simple it is and how obvious it should have just been to me the whole time and I just completely missed it. Really, I'm, I'm summarising here, but John is tackling a mindset, okay? And it's about the mindset that we as believers have towards our sins and how that relates to our belief in Jesus the Christ and our fellowship, or, or you might say association with one another. So... Over the next few slides, let's have a look at the simple language that John uses and see if he defines his own sentences, so see if we can grasp this. Okay. So, we already saw earlier in this study that there's two sides here, right? This ought to give us an, an indication of what John intended in saying in verse 9. Either we say we have no sin, and we say that we, you know, we have not sinned, or we confess our sins. They're, they're the two extremes. They're the opposites, okay? They're the choices, right? So, verses 4 and 5 establish that we, or you and you, you and you plural pronouns, are referring to believers, including John himself, and the people that he represents, and the group of people he is writing to, whom he predominantly calls little children throughout his epistle. So they were likely probably converts or people that John had ministered to, and John felt, you know, a burdening responsibility to watch over them, right? We have seen and heard. We declare unto you. We write unto you. That's who we are in chapter 1, right? Believers. Simple as that. In verses 8 to 10, we start each verse with if we say that or if we confess right okay so what we do is not strictly being tackled here because again sin inspections you've got to turn from all your sin it's not saying what we do it's saying what we say okay what we confess what we say so it's what we collectively as believers say or confess regarding our sins right now if if john was writing about any one individual or somebody who needs to be saved he could have just said if any man or he that or whosoever but he didn't say this okay he said we that's what he said we're all together in these verses okay so john in the in the second chapter then gives us a reason why he's writing right just so as to make sure that you don't misunderstand what he just said he writes onto you that reading his writing you do not sin okay that i write unto you that you sin not that's why he's writing okay now we dealt with that if we say that okay we have all the verses that say if we say that what happens if we do that okay what happens if we do sin well we have a condition here now this is where it gets interesting because it doesn't actually say we now now it actually says if any man sin right and that's quite interesting we're gonna to have to look into that uh, so it, it doesn't say we there, but if we, if any man sin, 
okay, then uh, that condition is met. Well, we have a solution. We have an advocate, okay? There's a solution there if any man happened to sin, right? Now then, let's start in verse 8. It's in the present tense. So sinless perfectionists can go, oh, it just means past tense. No, it's in the present tense, okay? That's what John said. He wrote it in the present tense. It's ourselves, okay? Because we as collective, so is ourselves. Now, in the sinless perfectionist framework, they ultimately can't say this to be theologically consistent with their own framework because their salvation doctrine does not allow this verse to be true in the present sense. Their position is you have to have no sin, including the propensity to even sin in some cases. Jesus only cleanses you of past sins. You can't have continued present sin, okay? So they will now, obviously you'll point out, you know, they deceive themselves, but they deny deceiving themselves. But the mentality behind them is that they ultimately do deceive themselves from this verse, as I will, you know, attempt to demonstrate later in this study. Now, you could interpret the ourselves as referring to our own individual selves or each other in the context of fellowship. It Really, it works either way, because if you and I both say that we have no sin, we deceive our individual selves, but because we fellowship with other, each other in saying that we have no sin, then we are also deceiving ourselves collectively, because we're saying that collectively, you and I, we do not sin, right? And I, and I will give you an example of this later. On the other hand, let's suppose that I say I have no sin, whereas you reject what I say, uh, and so then I don't deceive you, but I'm also not in fellowship with you. I wouldn't associate with you. I think you're a false prophet. You think, you think I'm a false prophet, so I'm, I would be deceiving myself, but I wouldn't be deceiving you. And, you know, from, from, the, from my perspective, it would be the other way around. You wouldn't be deceiving me either, right? Now then, moving on to verse 9. Again, it's all in the present tense, okay? If we, present tense, confess our sins, he is, present tense, faithful, and just to, present tense, forgive us our sins, and to, present tense, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, okay? If this passage only referred to the one-time conversion, John could have said, if we have confessed, or if any man confess, but again, that's not how the Holy Spirit moved him to speak, right? Now, there is a controversy to be addressed here. What exactly does John mean by confess? Is it, you know, what's the format of confession? Does he mean like a prayerful confession unto God? Or does he mean verbally confessing before men? Uh, what is the repetition of the confession? Is it just like a one-time confession? Like, you know, when John the Baptist baptised and people... Um, confess their sins but then what if it's one time what happens if we sin after this confession is it an ongoing confession what 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 about the sins of ignorance the thoughts of foolishness is sin un unpresumptuous sins honest mistakes struggling against the flesh okay if, it, if it's ongoing you know how does that all fit in there now confession as a word in the bible interestingly isn't actually as common as you might think it appears just over three dozen times in all its different forms, like past tense, present tense, you know, its different forms. And the underlying Hebrew word, you know, if you look it up in a concordance, can also mean like give thanks or praise in English, because the root word is to, to throw or cast, okay? And, and also, confession doesn't always refer to sin either. It's just like, oh, did you do something? You know, yes, I did it, or, you know, bring it to attention that you did something. So let's start with a one-time confession. Could it mean a one-time confession? And this is where we'd, we'd normally refer to baptism. Um, because in Matthew 3, 6, it's explained that the people who were baptised by John confessed their sins, right? Baptism is a one-time event that ought to occur at or shortly after the time of conversion. And in Acts 2, 38, baptism is explained to be the representation of the, the, the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, okay? So with this context in mind, people would say that confessing sin is an initial confession to admit that one is a sinner or, you know, if you're a sinless perfectionist, then, you know, repent of your sins for the purpose of believing on the Christ and getting saved, right? Because this is a one-time event, advocates would say that if, if you do some kind of an ongoing confession of sins, you're essentially denying forgiveness because you're not believing that Jesus Christ has already forgiven all of your sins, you know, past, present and future. That's the, the terminology that they'll use, right? But then, you know, we're just asking the questions. That's all we're doing right now. What about ongoing confession or the confession of somebody who is a believer? 
So, for example, James 5.16 instructs us as brethren to confess your faults. Now, the, the underlying Greek word is the same for sins. To one another. So that, that's a man-to-man confession for the purpose that you may be healed of that given sin. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, 22, Peter tells Simon the sorcerer to repent of a specific wickedness that the thought of his heart could be forgiven and that that's a very specific issue but but this was not in a salvation context because simon already believed and was baptized before this in verse 13. now in psalm 32 5 david declared um i will confess my transgression unto the lord so that's man to god now um a lot of brethren have a problem with this concept because it, it sounds like jesus hasn't really forgiven us our sins if we have to carry on confessing them but really if you read the psalm though and and just be honest about the language that david uses he already starts this psalm saying blessed is he whose transgression is you know present tense already forgiven and unto whom the lord uh, does not impute sin and then in verse 5 he says i have acknowledged my sin unto thee so that's like you know it's already happened And, and that's quite an important interpretation i think that'll probably give you a picture of what we're talking about he also says you forgave my iniquity past tense so that that's a past tense verse right there but he's still confessing his sins or he's still saying i will confess my sins in the future right uh, you know future tense so according to psalm 32 it's not un- unheard of or unbiblical to confess sins to god even though he already forgave you because that's what david did and your transgressions are forgiven right now, uh, but then we, we do raise another problem with this. If it does mean ongoing confession, and perhaps, you know, you might think that this is verbal confession, many people will object to this because of the following problems it presents with you. First of all, you cannot conceivably remember every single sin you have ever done. There's the first problem, right? Secondly, the Bible says we have secret sins like Psalm 98, sorry, Psalm 90 verse 8. Uh, we may have sinned in ignorance, not realizing that something is a sin, Leviticus 4 talks about that uh, and, there, and under this point you can see that there is a distinction between sins of ignorance and willful presumptuous sins like in, in Numbers um, and because of this some sinless perfectionists might say that you, they'll just say that you have to turn from all known sin so they'll they'll make like some kind of an exception to unknown sins and um, think how Chafee has said something like that um, some sins are open to interpretation about whether they really are sins so you know drinking wine if, if you're sober and you don't actually get drunk that's obviously something where christians will disagree with that or something like smoking where the bible obviously doesn't mention the, the practice um, even the thought of foolishness is sin right and you know proverbs 24 9 and we all go through hundreds if not thousands of foolish thoughts you know we go we all go through thousands of thoughts every day so you know you think at least a handful of them are foolish so then it it does present us with this problem because what happens if we don't confess these sins right well uh now let's consider the language of verse 9 then so it, it doesn't strictly say whether we confess our sins before men or before god it, it doesn't give us that context right confession is in the present tense which you, you might say if, if we were just to be unbiased about it you would say that it perhaps makes a stronger case for an ongoing confession rather than a one-off instance just because of how he uses that tense there but also as well remember that the word confess can actually itself have multiple meanings or applications so obviously it can mean to verbally disclose guilt even if somebody didn't actually ask you to confess but then on the other hand you could just admit it if you were questioned about it you know even if it's not a moral issue did you do this well yes either you did or either you confess you did or you deny right and, and so this is important, is, is that it can mean just to acknowledge or admit a particular belief. And actually very similar to the word profess, but with more honesty and sincerity. So obviously you could profess that Jesus is Lord, or you could confess that Jesus is Lord. The Bible uses both of those terminologies, and obviously profess is more of a negative term, confess is more of a positive term, right? But uh, what many people overlook is just the blatantly obvious about these verses, as I myself did, okay? We can easily define the word confess by its antonym, deny, right? They're opposing words. Confess, deny. They're the opposites. So either we confess or we deny. They're the two options, right? It's not, well, there's a third option. We just don't confess and don't deny. Either we deny or we confess, right? Likewise, we can easily 
define then, by the same logic, we can define what John meant by confession because of how he contrasts it with its opposite, right? The opposite of if we confess is if we say that. Either we confess our sins or we say that we have no sin. We say that we have not sinned. So then because of this perfectly simple dichotomy here, we can assume that confession in this context it's not whether you've personally got down on your knees and confess. It's about what we admit. It's about what we acknowledge in our collective belief about our sins and how this relates to the Christ. So confessing our sins is very simple. It's the opposite of saying, if we say we have no sin and we have not sinned. That's what it means, okay? So now, we don't need to explore verse 10 because you know there's, a, there's no disagreement with that. Most Christians agree that we've sinned. That's Christianity 101. Um, so you know, I'm not even going to address that. Um one of the controversies then between uh, sinless perfectionists and easy believists is that an easy believist will say god forgives us all sin past present and future now a sinless perfectionist will reply well that's found nowhere in the bible right now it is true that the bible never phrases it in this way it's really a gross oversimplification and it's really just a catchy phrase that that people use um, but there, there may be, and you know, perhaps this is stemming on my opinion a bit, but there may be some deliberate intention behind the reason why the Bible never says this verbatim. And I'll, I'll talk about this more towards the end of the study and why John phrases his epistle in the way that he does. Okay, so we'll perhaps leave that towards the end. So let, let's just try to illustrate these verses that are in the present tense without adding any presuppositions or doctrinal assumptions in their day-to-day -day application okay so it's if we so i'm going to illustrate this with a group of people if we okay and then on any given day because it's in the present tense we don't need to look at past present and future we just look at right now at any given time whether you're watching this today whether you happen to be watching it the next day or you watched it yesterday that's not the point on any given day, day one, day two, day three, we just apply this verse in its present ten states, okay? If we confess our sins, right? Or if we say that we have no sin. Now, in this we crowd, on any given day, what happens if any man sin, right? If we, and if any man sin, whether it's him, or whether it's him, or whether it's her, or whether it's him, or whatever. Well, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us right if we say that we have no sin that's what we say well we deceive ourselves they're the two options so you see how simple that is if you just take away any sort of you know predispositions that you already had about this um, passage so in the sinless perfectionist and easy believers and models so obviously in sinless perfectionism you've got the extreme end of work salvation and then easy believism is the extreme end of faith alone and lordship just kind of bounces around in the middle somewhere so in sinless perfectionism forgiveness or the cleansing of sin is a one-time event okay that's when you repented of your sins and salvation requires ongoing maintenance you have to put the work in to be saved or just to prove that you're really saved right you know they argue over semantics but really that their salvation requires maintenance forgiveness and sins is a one-time event because you have to turn from your sins to be saved right on the opposite end of the spectrum easy believism salvation is a one-time instantaneous event okay and we base that on bible verses like you know i am the door if any man shall enter in or you know he that drinks of the water that i shall give him it's like a cup of water right or a door that you enter in or you know even the narrow way few there be that find it not few there be that make it to the end it's few there be that find it once you found it you found it so salvation instantaneous one-time event passed from death onto life immediately and so any sins committed after salvation well then there's the ongoing it's, I mean, you could call it ongoing, could say Jesus did it all in the past, but that's really a, di a difference without distinction. Sins that you commit after you have believed the gospel, Jesus forgives them, he cleanses them, he covers sins committed after salvation, okay? So, what is the justification for saying that God forgives all sin, including present and future sins? Well, there's a lot of different ways you could explain this, like God's foreknowledge, for example, the fact that he knows somebody's going to sin tomorrow. I've talked about that before. 
but the study's on one job. So let's just simply see that the language that John himself is using. So John is using collective, inclusive language, as I've pointed out many times now. If this verse referred to unbelievers getting saved, he could have just said, if any man, and he didn't say it. He's writing in the present tense. He could have just said, forgive us our past sins. Or he could have just said, because we have confessed our sins, he was faithful. He could have just said that, if that's what he really meant, okay? And yet, despite what he said, okay, in, in one nine, he will go on to say in the next chapter, so despite saying present tense, forgive our sins, essentially, he now says, you are forgiven, present tense finished, okay? So we had present tense ongoing action, now we have present tense finished, okay? They're both true, right? Now, why are you forgiven? Because you turned from all your sins and you don't sin anymore, not what it says. You're forgiven for his name's sake, okay? It's all to do with what Jesus did, it's not because of what you did, right? So, you know, you turning from sins has nothing to do with the reason given here. So we see, we see two things happening in the present tense. God is just, present tense, the action is pending and ongoing, assuming we meet the condition. We confess our sins, right? Your sins are forgiven. The action is complete, assuming that the recipients of John's letter have already met the condition, that we confess our sins, right? So you, he, he forgives you and you are forgiven. They're both true, right? And just in case you still insist that this passage only covers past sins that chapter two already sets it up for you. John goes on to explain what happens if any man sin, present tense. Well, what happens? We have an advocate. He is the propitiation. That's the outcome if that condition is met. Now, at the same time, yes, we recognize that John is writing this epistle with the assumption that we sin not. Now, there is a fundamentally important reason why he says this, because think about it. If the sinless perfectionist view of verse 8 to 10 was correct, that, you know, it's all about turning from your sin and not sinning anymore, well, John wouldn't need to clarify this then, would he? Because nobody would read verses 8 to 10 and say, well, you know, we, we could just go out and sin. If it meant sinless perfectionism, you wouldn't get that impression from reading verse 10, right? The reason he has to explain this, I write these things so that you sin not, is because reading 8 to 10, you could come to the conclusion that you're either supposed to sin or that it's okay to sin, right? Because you would not read it and think sinless perfectionism. It's, it's as simple as that. Otherwise, John wouldn't need to clarify this because it would already be obvious from what he just said, right? So, you know, he's clearly said, we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive. So why does he need to clarify that he writes we don't sin? Well, the reason is because somebody could, if they wanted to, try and use this end of chapter one as a license to sin deliberately, willfully, and unrepentantly. We'll, we'll come back to that um, later for a bit more clarity on that. Now, someone might object to this saying um, later in the epistle, you know, what about all the verses about the commandments? What about he who commits sin is of the devil? What about he that is born does not sin? Born of God, I should have said. Uh, we, you know, I will deal with those in the chapters when we get to separate study videos, all in good time. But what we, excuse me, have seen up to now is that John is tackling the type of mindset that we have. Either we have the mindset that says, we've not sinned, we have no sin, and if, if this is our mindset, we deceive ourselves. We walk in darkness, right? On the other hand, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, and we walk in the light, right? There, there are two options here. There are mindsets. Like, which one of these categories do you fit in, right? Now, um, I'm going to digress just for a few slides, because obviously I'm saying that John is tackling a mindset, not behaviour. And so picking up on that point, um, what I just want to talk about briefly is that there's there's a lot of passages in the Bible where people misappropriate those passages to be all about your works and what you actually do, but they completely overlook or just willfully ignore the mindset of the people that are even being dealt with. So let, let's just give an example. For example, in Matthew 7, you know, you've heard sinless perfectionists and lordshipers say this, you know, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, right? Depart from me that works iniquity. And so the sinless perfectionists will pay close attention to verses 21, where it says, do the will of the Father, and verses 23, which says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. They'll pay close attention to that bit, but what they completely overlook or just willfully ignore or just dance around is the mentality 
of the people to whom Jesus is speaking, right? The simple fact of the matter is they bragged about their works. So you can say, well, it says they worked iniquity. Yeah, but they bragged about their works. You know, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? Okay. And if, you know, if you want to say, well, they had works, but they also had sins. Well, there's really only two options here. Either they had, the, either their works were right or wrong, right? And they're bragging about their works. That's their mentality. So, you know, they, they were bragging in what they did. They didn't say, Lord, did we not believe in you? Lord, didn't you not say that you would not lose any that you have given eternal life to? They never brought any attention to the things that Jesus did. They're bringing attention to what they did themselves. Now, here's another example. You've got Matthew 25, when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, right? So, again, they will pay close attention to where Jesus commends the sheep for doing good works and rebukes the goats for, for not doing the works, right? So they'll pay close attention to that. We'll see you must be doing the work. But the thing, again, look at the mentality of the people that Jesus is talking to. Don't overlook the fact that the righteous, the sheep, what's their answer? Lord, when did we see you hungered and fed you? When did we see you thirsty and gave you a drink? When did we see a stranger and take you in? Or, you know, when did we see you naked? You know what I mean? When, when did we do any of these things, right? Whereas the, the goats... They're denying failing the works. Lord, when, when did we see you hunger and not minister unto you? When did we not do these things, Lord? So you see how the sheep, sorry, the goats, they're denying failing the works. Lord, when did we not do this? Of course we did this, Lord, right? Whereas the sheep, when did we do that, Lord? When did I do these good works? Don't remember it. Because they have the mentality that they're not justified by their works, right? If you're justified by your works, that's how you've got to defend yourself, like the goats, okay? So this is just what they completely overlook, is, is the mentality, the mindset that the sheep had versus the goats. And obviously, you know, when we talk about repentance, what does repentance mean? Change your mind. It's your mindset. It's the way that you think that's the problem, okay? And so this is why I say it's about the, the mindset that we have as believers that John is tackling. And that's why... In verses 8 to 10 of chapter 1, he's saying, if we say, or if we confess. He isn't saying if we do, or if we do not. Now, yes, he, do, he does say, do not the truth, and walk in the light. But again, again, what is the truth? The truth is not a list of moral instructions. It's an acknowledgement of what is fundamentally true, right? And according to John, the same type of person that does not do the truth, or walks in darkness, is exactly the kind of person, the same kind of person that says we have no sin, right? So... What we believe about our sins is still the point being addressed. Now, somebody who has a works-based salvation, what they've got to do is they've got to move the goalposts of holiness so that they can still get in, right? They've got to come up with exceptions for their sins. Now then, sinless perfectionists and, and lordshippers for that matter might take what I've been saying in this study and say that you're trying to justify your sin or you're trying to make people comfortable in their sin right but the, the problem with statements like this is that it's really just sensationalism and if you follow what john has been say, saying to its logical conclusion it's it's really i would argue that it's they themselves that are trying to justify their sin and feel comfortable in their sin and i say this because as somebody who's under grace i can actually confess which you know admit my sins and although i should not have done those sins but i have i i can acknowledge it right i can say that i was wrong and and do not you know to do those things and god is faithful to forgive me and to cleanse me right whereas those who are stuck under the law especially sinless perfectionists they ultimately cannot admit their sins after they've you know after after they've claimed to repent of their sins because if they did confess those sins they would have to admit that they might have lost their salvation and that they were not free from sin, right? You know, their interpretation of what that means. So their entire soteriological framework comes crashing down because the, the gospel that they profess cannot even say themselves. And, and this is why, uh, you know, John says they deceive themselves. I'm, I'm going to give you some examples to, to help, you know, qualify this. Now, just as a disclaimer, you know, please don't understand my upcoming posts to be an attempt to sort of brag about myself or look good. That's not the case, okay? I'm, I'm referencing myself and conversations or things, exchanges that I've had with other people because obviously that's the easiest thing for me to reference. Uh, so, you know, it's not about me looking good, but I'm trying to show you 
why I hold to easy believism and why that's even consistent with with 1 John 8 to 10 okay and why you know I'm arguing that it's the sinless perfectionist who's making excuses to feel comfortable in his sin not me that's what I'm arguing okay so um example number one so if you're very familiar with my channel content you will know that I have done quite a bit of work to refute um a guy who's now called abide in the word but he used to be called epuc on apologetics and i made um i meant several assertions about him but these were a few so um on multiple occasions i've said that he has knowingly and willfully misappropriated a bible passage to be about salvation when that's not even necessarily the subject matter like when, when paul says run the race for example right uh, and I have, I have said that he has deliberately made false claims about what a passage actually says with willful intent. So like when Revelation 20 says the dead are judged, right? And he says, oh, it means Christians are judged, things like that. Um, he also claimed, he, he did a whole video with another guy where uh, they use, they referenced Irenaeus's book against heresies and they exposed one saved, always saved as being a Gnostic or Marcionite heresy based on that book but the thing is they didn't really provide any meaningful quotes from the book to prove what he was saying and they just quote some random passage where like Irenaeus was denouncing Marcion and they say oh see that was because he preached what but it's like just asserting conclusions really now I refute I did a video refuting it but unlike them I actually provided quotes from the book on the screen okay showing you all the quotes and all the things that Irenaeus was actually saying against uh, the Gnostics and basically demonstrating that, that his claims were fundamentally untrue that's that's what I was asserting now here's the problem with people like him he will never admit to any of this okay he can't admit it even if he just wanted to say yeah I was wrong about that passage but it was an accident he, he can't even do it by accident right because if he admitted that he had done it deliberately right then all of his regular viewers, the Turn From Sins crowd that boast in their works, they would all realise then that he's a liar and a fraud because he comes out and says repent of his sin and he hasn't turned from his own sins, right? So, you know, his own gospel damns himself. And he prides himself on destroying a lot of the faith alone and OSAS arguments. And so even admitting that he did it accidentally is really going to look rather embarrassing for him, to, to say the least, okay? So... Uh, now, at, the t at least at the time of me doing this study video right now, I'm not aware that he has ever publicly responded to any of these accusations, okay? So, you know, I, I don't know as much as whether he even knows what I've even said about him, but they do get an email, you know, when you tag somebody on, on a video. But anyway, I'm not aware that he's ever responded to it up to this time, right? So, uh, he's never admitted any of this or even just tried to defend himself against my claims. Um, so because he's never publicly responded, nor has he ever messaged me privately about this either, I can't exactly say how he would reply to these allegations. So would he do one of the following? Would he try and turn it back on me that I'm being a false accuser? Because other people have tried to confront him about stuff, but then what a lot of false prophets do is they try and spin it on the person who's attacking them and make it about them. Um, could he actually defend the things that I attacked him for? Could he open his, the Bible where, you know, I said it, he was lying and prove that I, he was actually telling the truth from those passages, you know, without digressing to a load of other random quote mind passages, which is what a lot of them do. You confront them about a passage, they just run off to some other passage. Could he open the book of Ir Irenaeus and expo examine my counterclaims and defend himself? Or would he just come up with a bunch of excuses as to why he did not sin? And so with, with people like this, they, they usually find that by ignoring such accusations and any prodding questions, is, is really is the safest way to deal with them. It's, it's safer for him to just completely ignore everything I've ever said and not respond. That's the safe option, right? So now I too have made false claims on my channel, believe it or not, and I was wrong to do so, okay? But the difference between me and a sinless perfectionist, him, is that I can confess it, right? And guess what? God is faithful and just to forgive me. So, for example, I'll give you an example. I did a long study video about repentance and I attacked an article on Ray Comfort's website because I was basically complaining that the Bible verses are not in the body of the article. They're like in a little pop-up that you have to hover your mouse and show the pop-up. But then there was a particular time where I was even moaning about it verbally, complaining that it, it doesn't include the verse in the article. And it was right there on the screen as I was moaning about it, right? And it was just because I'm just hearing, I couldn't, you know, I'm talking faster than I can think. And I just, I just missed it because I'm, I'm concentrating on what I have to say. So by mistake, I falsely accused the writer of the article of hiding that verse when he didn't. Now, 
I was wrong. I made a mistake, okay? Now, I can confess my sins as per 1 John 1 9, so I can admit this and I can say it was a mistake. So in the comments, I publicly pinned a comment saying, look, I, I did this by mistake, okay? And I can do this, right? Because the free gift of grace allows me to. I'm not trying to obey my way to heaven as a sinless perfectionist, so I don't have to deny or pretend that I, I didn't do this wrongly, okay? It was a mistake and I was wrong to do it, but I still did it, okay? Not not even willfully, but I did it. That's just the simple fact of the matter. Now, let's example number two then. So somebody, this guy's called Progger Frogger, and he's a regular, uh, he regularly listens to um, Abide in the Words material and comments on it, and a few other sinless perfectionists in that circuit. And he's also seen my content against Abide in the Word, right? And he's, he's commented on stuff. And interestingly, um, I actually featured this commentator on one of my videos where he you know, says we have to be justified by works. He does like all himself. He does nothing for the kingdom of God. So he saw my video accusing Abide of the word in the word of making false claims about Irenaeus's book and likening Osas to Gnosticism. Now he didn't respond to any of the accusations being put forth. He didn't try to defend him. He, he, he didn't even prove that I was wrong. He didn't even say anything about the fact that a supposed turn from your sins preacher just willfully lied out of his mouth. Right? He dismissed the entire argument. By invoking it as a fallacy, even though the, the video never even set out to prove that Osas is true, it was just disproving, well that section at least, it was disproving that it's a Gnostic doctrine, that's what it was disproving, it's proving that a sinless perfectionist has lied through his front teeth, okay? He just dismisses it as a fallacy, he has nothing to say about the accusations, he's not interested in what's true, okay, he's not interested in the facts, he's got to find ways to dismiss it, because that's all he can do, right? Now, in another video I made, I was browsing through the channels of people who follow Abide in the Word, including Progger Frogger, and I highlighted a comment where he called faith alone a false doctrine for deceived Christians, right? Now, when I looked on his YouTube channel, even at the time of this study video that I'm recording right now, he has done naff all for the kingdom of God. He could not be bothered to do one video to preach the gospel on his channel. He can't be bothered. He's lazy, right? If you've got time to sit there commenting all day and you want to say that we have to turn from our sins and, have, and do, do these works, you've got time to do some content for YouTube. It's as simple as that. No excuses, right? And then I also found a playlist, a playlist of just worldly music. Now, some of it's Christian worldly. This is the worldly music. Uh, like, you know, rap music and, like, rock music and all kinds of stuff. And, like, one of the, including the Beatles, right? He just edited it, like, two days before I recorded the footage for that video. So, it, I think he's since either he's deleted it or he's, he's hidden it from public view because I, I couldn't find it anymore. But, you know, basically the Beatles. I mean, John Lennon said that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus, okay? And they featured, like, a segment of Aleister Crowley's head. And, you know, Aleister Crowley was a Satanist, if you don't already know on one of the album covers, and it's actually suggested that Aleister Crowley heavily influenced the work of the Beatles, and they admired his writings. Okay, a Satanist, right? And this turn from your sins, live a new life, deny yourself, pick up your cross guy, is listening to their music, right? You know, being in the world. They're all talk, right? So he, he does not, by his own standards, he does nothing. He doesn't turn from his own sins. So I featured him in that video, Let's see how he responded. What was his response? Well, he just made a joke of the whole thing and suggested that I learn the lyrics featured in some, like, I've got, I'm the one who needs correcting or something. You know, he, he just, I'm so honoured by the attention, just made a complete joke out of it. He had nothing to say about the accusations being put forth. And he thinks that his good works are getting people to respond to comments about, like, you posting comments in YouTube is not work, okay? If you sit there in front of all the, that is not work. That's not what the word, word means. It doesn't end there, though, okay? You know, I managed to find a comment in another post that he's put on somebody else's channel and saw something very interesting that he said to somebody else. Adam, of Epic, which is Abide in the Word now, does not sin. Keith, of Y City Preachers, does not sin. I do not sin. We might sin in the future, but we have no intention of ever doing it again, and we will only be saved by repenting from whatever sin could befall us. The unrighteous and sinners will not inherit the kingdom of with the scriptures. So, you know, basically he says he doesn't sin, and he says that abiding the word doesn't sin when I've publicly exposed you for doing nothing and even lying about the Bible. It's, it's unbelievable, right? So, in summary, just to summarise what I said, this person calls faith alone a deceptive heresy, yet does no work on his YouTube channel whatsoever. Okay, look, comment in comments. Maybe it's a bit of work, but it's not real work, though, is it? If you've got time to do that all day, you've got time to make your own content. 
he may do works in the real world for I like. Maybe he does scream at people in the streets. But you, you'd think if he's got time to post comments on YouTube, he'd have time to make his own content. Just saying. He hearkens to preachers who claim they are without sin and preach living a holy life, away from the things of this world and crucifying the flesh, yet he listens to worldly music that was possibly even influenced by a Satanist. Okay. He sees evidence presented to him right in front of his face that the people he follows are liars and frauds who lie about what Irenaeus said, okay? And all he has to say, oh, it's just a fallacy, it's just a fallacy. He just dismisses it with a fallacy fallacy, okay? And yet, on top of all of that, he still claims that he's without sin, okay? His gospel requires him to be, quote, free from sin, end quote. Yet, even says we might sin in future that's what he said so you know if that happens then we must repent or or die and right so like what if the tables were turned right what if Prog frogger found some dirt on me or had something against me to, to criticize about well funnily enough that actually did happen i'll show you on the next slide right in one of my videos ripping on abide in the word he declined to comment on anything that i actually said in the video again but joined in a conversation i was having with somebody else that had nothing to do with him about old testament saints and it was the whole thing about whether they go you know went to heaven or went to abraham's bosom in like the nice half of hades i'm not going to get into that now now he accused me of misquoting the bible literally by one word okay because i said that lazarus would was carried up to abraham's bosom when actually the bible says he was carried into right so i misquoted but by one word i misquoted the bible but i misquoted the bible right Luke 16, you know, it says that he was carried into. So I just, I acknowledge that and I apologize. You know, I said, I have to apologize for using the word up and I explain why, you know, I accidentally conflated the carrying into with the went up. Okay. I made a mistake. I confessed. I just, yes, I was wrong. I accidentally misquoted the Bible there. But you know what? Because I confess it, God is faithful and just to forget it. It was an accident. Okay. I can confess my faults. He can't right and and the thing is he wants to like criticize me for literally misquoting the bible by one little word right abide in the word constantly misquotes and misappropriates the bible all the time i've exposed him for doing it but you see Proger frogger won't challenge him on that he won't tell hey you're misquoting the bible he'll do it to me he won't do it to the sinless perfectionist right he'll challenge me on one minor word but he's all he's got he's just got excuses and excuses and excuses for his own sins and the sins of the people that he fellowships with you know if we say that if we confess that now there are other examples i can give but obviously they're all anecdotes so you know i think you get the point it, it's very easily easy to see how sinless perfectionists deceive themselves and and this really is the very very deception that john is talking about it tries trying to highlight this in the first chapter of his epistle people like Proger frogger and a bride in the word they will say about themselves we have no sin and he has no sin and i have no sin and they will fellowship with one another because of this affirmation right their online fellowship is based around this thing that they think they don't sin right well i will not fellowship with them because i say they have sin and they will not fellowship with me because i confess that i have sin right but they have no fundamental proof that either one of them doesn't sin they don't they don't even see each other every hour of every day they can't read each other's minds they have no fundamental proof that their day-to-day -day life is any more obedient than mine is really you know Proger frogger assumes that abide in the word does not sin because he has a youtube channel where he constantly tells everybody to turn from their sins for salvation right and abide in the word assumes that Proger frogger does not sin because he's a supporting subscriber that's it they would both assume that i sin purely on account of preaching faith alone. but but none of these affirmations prove anything okay anybody can get up and do a video on youtube saying hey you have to turn from your sins you have to obey you have to... it doesn't mean they're doing it okay and just because somebody follows them and gives them a yes and amen it doesn't mean that person's doing it okay it's as simple as that these affirmations prove nothing at all about anybody right now i can confront them seven ways until sunday about their sins they will deny it they will not hear it they will refuse to address it they say they have no sin they deceive themselves right and it's really it's the same with any other sinless perfectionists that i mentioned earlier like like mike rakowski i, mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of that guy 
but like even after a million years burning in hell he wouldn't confess his sins because he fancies himself he claims that he's a sanctified in truth disciple of christ who's overcome sickness and sin and has learned to test the spirits and you can't confront him about his sins because you're not a sanctified in truth disciple and you can still sin and get sick and he can't apparently so yeah i mean if you want to know what an, if you if you've never heard of him before and you want to know what an i am looks like that guy is an i am okay way more than abide in the word by the way so the thing is, you know, I can admit my sins. I have an advocate, right? God is faithful and just to forgive me for my sins because I just admit it. Yeah, I was wrong. Sorry. Yeah, true. true. Thank God Jesus died for my sins, right? Um, I'm not going to address the lordship spectrum because it's really just a dilution between these two uh, examples. But I, I think you get the point here. John only gives us two types of people, not three. So, you know, there can't really be a third person that, that's sort of one foot in both. So, um you know, I'm not. I'm not really going to address any lordship points, but you, you're hopefully starting to get the picture of what I'm talking about now. So, really, you, you see how quickly and, and just how simple John's statements really are. There's so much controversy about how we interpret verses eight to ten. You know, these little verses. It, it, it's really quite simple. And, and just to clarify, if this is not already obvious. I am not suggesting that to obtain forgiveness, you need to be aware of and confess in heart and in word every single tiny micro sin that you ever do and fall in your knees and absolute tears and for, for reasons that were already given earlier in the study, such as the sins of ignorance. OK, that's not the point. That's not the point that I'm getting at. The point is the mentality, the belief that you have about your sins. Just acknowledge that you still struggle with your sins in your mortal body and just a simple acknowledgement that you are not a sinlessly perfect, self-righteous I am, okay? Because Mike Rakowski is an I am, and Abide in the Word is an I am, okay? And Progger Frogger is an I am. That's all I'm saying. The mentality that John is tackling here, don't be an I am, okay, about your sins. Then the point then is, it's about the mentality that we have towards our sins, which fundamentally revolves around what we believe about salvation okay do you acknowledge that you still sin in ignorance or, or just unintentionally do you, you just acknowledge it if confronted do you acknowledge that even the thought of foolishness is sin if somebody confronts you about an obvious sin or a, a blatantly false claim that you made about the bible would you come up with a million and one excuses for it or just ignore the accusation and pretend you didn't hear it or, or would you turn not turn it on the person confronting you and make it about them being a bad person or rather would you just rather confess it and say that you were wrong? I mean, it's a lot easier that way, really, sometimes. Now, there will be certain circumstances, and there's kind of a disclaimer, that where a brother or a sister in Christ denies certain sins and does justify oneself, and yet the opinion of another brother or sister is that he did indeed sin right now this this doesn't undermine his salvation because actually you know the bible does prepare us for, for that to happen because you know in the new testament there's there's frequent places where jesus or the apostles give instructions on how to resolve conflicts with one another and, and the church is required to to settle these issues and we're required to forgive each other right because there, there will be conflict there will be denial about certain sins even among saved brethren, right? Because that's why the church is there to resolve these disputes. Because the reason why we have a dispute is because one person's claiming that a sin happened and they were wronged, and another person is denying it. So, you know, like we don't need to get too wrapped up in the legalistic thing of all our sins that we can face, but it's about the mindset that we have of acknowledging our sin generally. Okay. Now, you might have noticed that um, there's a lot of similarity here then between what John is saying and the uh, story of the publican and the Pharisee in the temple in Luke 18. The Pharisee obviously being prideful, despite thanking God, and believe it or not, and not being like the publican because of, of you know his righteous deeds, while, while the publican simply calls on God's mercy on account of being a sinner, right? Now, um, a sinless perfectionist will essentially do the same thing with that parable as they do with one John, that it's just about recognising that we have sinned in the past. But the thing is, the parable says no such thing because... It doesn't tell us what sins the Pharisee was guilty of, or if he had previously been repentant earlier in his life. It doesn't tell us that the publican had done any sin recently or would stop sinning after this parable. You don't know that from the parable. You don't have the salient facts. And so, once again, it's not the works, it's the mentality. It's what you believe, it's your mind that needs to be transformed here. The issue, fundamentally, what do you believe? Because it's the mentality of the publican that justified him, not the Pharisee, right? A sinless perfectionist, sinless perfectionism will steer you to the mentality of the Pharisee. Grace will steer you towards the, the mentality of, of the publican, okay? 
So wrapping up chapter one then, we see how simple and comprehensible John's statements are, really. There are there are simply two types of people, and either we end up fellowshipping with one type, or we fellowship with the other type. So either we say we have no sin and we have not sinned, or we, we confess our sins. They're, they're the two opposites. So either we say we have not sinned, and this could apply to both sinless perfectionists and those who deny being sinners, or we just say, yes, we have sinned. Or we can say we have turned from all of our sins and we don't sin, or we can just confess that we struggle with sin, or we can say, well, we're not trying, we, we really have turned from our sins, we're still good people. Or, on the other hand, we can say we are trying, most of us at least, but but we still fall short of the glory of God. And uh, if, if somebody confronts us about our sins, well, either we end up in this camp where we just end up saying, la, 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 I can't hear you, you're a false accuser, or that's not really sin, God is okay with it. Or we just, on the other hand, we can say, yes, I, I was wrong, sorry about that. And consequently, either we lie and do not the truth, we walk in darkness, we deceive ourselves, or we, we have fellowship with him and we walk in the light, and he is faithful and just to forgive us and, and to cleanse us, and we have an advocate. And so, uh, just picking up on this point here, this is kind of like a quick point, is that when we pick up on these two mindsets, sinless perfectionists will often try and lump um, believers in grace, faith alone Christians, with all the apostate Christians who don't really believe that they're sinners, you know, because they'll just lump them all together and say, well, you're all just a bunch of sinners. But this is really inaccurate, though, and it's really, it's more of a reflection on them, the sinless perfectionists, because... As with Christians who don't believe that they are really sinners, or they, they take a diluted stance on sin, well, they, well, that's not really sin, they are both in a com position where they can't really confess their sin. Okay, because a, a modernist Christian who doesn't really believe that they are sinners, or, or doesn't believe in certain sins, um, they're stuck in an awkward position of not being able to confess their sins, because you know, to the effect that God would be faithful and just to forgive. Because if they did it would expose them as not really being good people as they believe that they are. Whereas uh, a sinless perfectionist, likewise, who believes that they have turned from all of their sins, they're then stuck in this awkward position of also not being able to confess any more sins to, be, to the effect that God would be just and, and faithful to forgive. Because if, if they did, then they would be exposed as still being unrepentant sinners and they forfeit their salvation according to the doctrine that they believe in. So you see, really, the sinless perfectionist is just in the same boat as the person who doesn't really believe that they are sinners. When you confront them about their sins, they're in an awkward position where they can't really confess it. So we're coming towards the end of our study now, but seeing as we have continued into the first two verses of the next chapter, there is one last crucial point to address, and this is... Um, why has John used collective language such as we, but then uh, now in chapter 2 verse 1 the sin applies to if any man? Why has John made this about an individual person rather than our collective fellowship? And, and this is a tough question and one which rather cautiously is subject to my opinion rather than easily proven dogmatic doctrine. So because of this, you know, please do approach this question cautiously and, and carefully investigate what I'm going to say in the upcoming slides. So just in, just in case we end up with the wrong impression from the end of chapter one, John is clarifying for us. He, he writes these things so that reading it, you don't sin. That's the goal, okay? So it, so it is assumed that as brethren, we are exhorting one another not to sin, okay? As a, as a group of believers and not having the mentality that it's okay to carry on sinning, okay? And yet, despite writing his epistle with the intention that we don't sin, John recognises that there will be a situation where a man may sin, okay? So if John says if, and notice he doesn't say when any man sin, that, that this then raises the question, does this mean that this should be a minority situation and that generally speaking, most people won't sin, okay? And, and this, because the sinless perfectionist will try and use this against you saying, well, it only says if, because you should have turned from all of your sins, right? Well, uh, so we'll explore this question um, a little more. So uh, perhaps a good complementary passage to this, I think, would be Solomon's Prayer, because we also start with this if condition, but we do also have more clarity as well. So just as we saw in 1 John, we have an if, okay, though in this case it's if they rather than if, if any man, but the, if you read the passage in its context, the context is God's own people, okay, this is not referring to the Gentiles or the pagans or the heathen, this is if your people, if God's people, if they sin against you, be you being God there, thee, okay, so yet, despite what he just said, so we just said if, 
right? It, it may happen, it may not happen. But then he goes on to say in brackets immediately after that, for there is no man which sins not. So he doesn't say for there are some men that sin and most of us don't. It's there is no man that sins not. And that's appended to this if statement right here. Okay, so the condition is if because it's expected then that it will happen, right? Because there isn't anybody that doesn't sin, right? So, you know, that don't let people use that if against you. Now, this is this is but one verse. There are many verses in the Old Testament where we, we have these ifs, such as uh, Levitical sacrifices, but, but these conditions exist because it is inevitable that these, these conditions will be met. Now, why is it inevitable? Because there is no man that does not sin, right? And in fact, a, a repetitive pattern in the Old Testament is that God's people would sin, be driven out of their land, but if they turned back to God, then they would be brought back to the promised land. And yet we saw repeatedly throughout the Old Testament that they would just stumble over and over and over again. So God's pe people simply could not turn from wickedness with their whole heart. And so that, that's why they needed their much-awaited saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, another good complementary passage, I think, and this is perhaps a, a little bit off course, but uh, it's just an interesting passage, is this if in Psalm 89. So if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments and if they break my statutes. Now, in its immediate context, it refers to David and his children. OK, but it, we also we see messianic undertones to this psalm as well that would really elevate this to being about Jesus and his seed, his people. OK, the people of Christ as well. So we can still apply this psalm to ourselves. What, what if we forsake God's law? What if we don't walk in his judgments? What if we break his commandments? What will happen? OK, well, notice then in the verses uh, from this psalm how God will respond to this disobedience. Okay, I will visit the rod with iniquity. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not take, etc., etc. So he doesn't say they will forfeit their salvation and I will cast them into hell. That's not what this psalm says. He doesn't even say I will forsake them as they have forsaken me. Again, not what it says. It, it doesn't even say they will prove that I never knew these workers of iniquity. Rather, what he does say is, I will visit their transgression and iniquity with stripes and the rod. So, so there is a specific way in which God deals with the sons of the uh, sins of the sons of David. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue twister there, and it, it doesn't involve salvation. But I will not utterly take his uh, a take from him my loving kindness. Now, I'm not aware that any direct verse ties in uh, loving kindness with salvation, but obviously we would generally assume that the free gift of salvation is a part of his loving kindness. Okay. Uh, he says, my faithfulness will not fail. And as John said, he is faithful and just to forgive. So this is all about God's faithfulness, not about our faithfulness as it applies to forgiveness. OK, I will not break my covenant. His seed will endure forever. And in the New Testament, we have clear commitments from Christ that he will lose. Not, uh, he will not lose any that he's given eternal life to. Right. And eternal life is, by definition, ever enduring. OK, so, you know, we, we still see that it's, it's still a natural pattern in the Bible that God's people will inevitably sin and so psalms like this really help us to understand how god will deal with the sons uh, the sons of david as opposed to say the outsiders so yes this passage is conditional there is an if but it's because john knows that it will inevitably happen because we have that pattern in the bible so what he's doing is then he's offering the solution when the condition is met so why does he say if any man sin why not just say if we sin if he's been saying if we say that if we confess that why then make this about any man rather than we okay now this is uh err on the side of caution here because this is where i'm now going to have to employ my opinion and i believe that john is being very deliberate about the language that he's using here intentionally so that we don't get the wrong impression or the wrong conclusion about what he's saying now obviously when something's subject to my opinion we understand it, it may be wrong because i'm kind of arguing from a lack of scriptural clarity so if the sinless perfectionist viewpoint were true that the holy spirit who foreknows that we would be arguing about this in 2023 could have moved John to write this epistle just a little bit differently so that we wouldn't get the wrong impression, right? Well, this is what, for example, this is what John could have said. He could have said, my little children, these things I write unto you because you sin not, right? Because remember this crowd that he's writing to already know the truth. John already clarifies that. And if any man sin, so if, if this any one man sin, we who sin not have an advocate, right? So John could have emphasized that the recipients don't sin because later verses clarify that they already know the truth. They've overcome the wicked one already. And that we who sin not, 
they're they're like we're, we're a separate group from the man who sins so you know if he would have worded it like that then we would say okay well that man who sins he doesn't have an advocate but the rest of us still have our advocate right he could have written it like that if he wanted us to, to, to give us that impression on the other hand as well he could have said alternatively and if any man sin he is not of god and believes in vain but we have an advocate so again alternatively he could just could have just clarified for us that the man who does sin has not god okay he has a vain belief he's a false believer but we on the other hand we have the advocate the true believers who don't sin right and i'm just saying john could have said that if that's what he really meant and this is the problem with sinless perfectionism they assert these conclusions but then they make john sound like a crazy person whose writings don't even make sense with the subject matter right that's but the thing is these two things that's not how the holy spirit moved john to speak okay once again the wording that john is using does not match that of a sinless perfectionist okay so on the other hand uh, we must also recognize we must be careful to acknowledge this in in easy believism end of the spectrum that john's epistle doesn't say these sorts of things either now you'll hear a lot of christians say well we're always going to sin brother well we all have a sinful nature and that's just the way it is and well it's okay because god has forgiven us but john did not say if we sin for we always sin every minute of every day uh, and you know and we always will until we die we have an advocate john didn't say that either so it's important that we recognize that as well that we're not trying to put words in their mouth that they didn't personally say and so the reason why i'm saying this i believe in it is, it is my opinion but the way that john is writing here it's very balanced okay he's not writing sinless perfectionist drivel all right he's offering a meaningful solution when a man sins and it's all about what christ did it's not about that man turning from his sins we have an advocate jesus christ it's all what jesus does right yet also despite this or you could say as well as this john also uses language that drives us towards having the attitude of seeking not to sin right and as a group of believers who together are seeking not to sin that's why he wrote his letter and so when we say things like well you're always going to sin like, i get what you're saying but i don't know if the mentality of what you're saying is necessarily very helpful because you're also applying a defeatist attitude towards it as well and i don't think that's helpful either and so i think what john is offering here is a balanced way of styling his letter so once again because as i asserted earlier in chapter one that john was tackling the mindset that we have it's also important here then that we have the right mindset so these group of guys these uh, fellowships of, of believers so-called if they all say well we don't sin we have turned from all of our sins well the, the people who proclaim this cannot be held accountable for their sins because their doctrines forces them to deny it okay and this leads to pride it leads to hypocrisy and really john would be setting a very unrealistic expectation okay you try confronting a sinless perfectionist about their sins you're not going to get anywhere it's as simple as that um on the on the other hand if we also have this attitude that says well we're always going to sin all the time well this attitude is not helpful either because you can't deny the fact that john did write this epistle that we don't sin okay this is this kind of mindset if we just go around saying this oh well you know we're always going to sin so you know never mind that does also prompt people to not that teaches people not to care about it and not try and do anything about it okay and i, I don't think that that attitude is is helpful either so uh you know this is a more helpful attitude then we we have a group of believers but if any man sins so whether it's him or whether it's her or whether it's we're not saying if we all sin but rather just if any man sin we have an advocate okay and this is a more helpful attitude then because we have the goal that we sin not but we just we acknowledge the reality and just admit the fact that from time to time a man among us will sin it will happen it's just it's that simple okay but we do have a solution jesus christ is our advocate and as per chapter one we ought to have the mindset that we confess but without using this as an excuse to just carry on doing it all the time unrelentingly right rather we, we counsel each other not to sin and so you see there's a really balanced way that johnny's writing his epistle here just so that we don't get the wrong impression or that so nobody can abuse this epistle okay and this is very similar to how paul writes as well again paul doesn't use phraseology or terminology that encourages people to just carry on sinning because you've always been forgiven but he also doesn't set on realistic and unachievable expectations as the sinless perfectionists do so you know on the one hand what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound 
God forbid, okay? We don't carry on in sin that grace may abound. However, where sin abounds, or where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Well, someone could use that. Well, no, we go back round here then, don't we? If, if Shall we continue in sin? No. Oh, but what if somebody sins? Well, then we go back over here then, don't we? You know, grace abounded. And so, you know, we, we have a balanced view here. We're not setting unrealistic expectations, but we're also, you know, not denying the problem either, okay? Furthermore, we also see how the second chapter continues this same thought from chapter one and really complements John, uh, what John just said. Now, as you may know, sinless perfectionists, more often than not, most of them anyway, believe that you can lose your salvation because of sin. Hence, it's called conditional security, right? When you invoke a passage on eternal uh, security, like, for example, I should lose nothing or, you know, no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand, they always respond with this, but what's the condition? You have to be following him. You have to be doing this. You won't just say it. You have to be doing something for that condition. Well, I submit to you that this is a passage where they conveniently ignore the condition because if they followed it to its logical conclusion, it fundamentally proves that a sinless perfectionist has no coverage for sin, whether past or present in sin. Because what is the condition? The condition is if any man sin, right? We have an advocate. So if the sinless perfectionists say of themselves, well, we don't sin, well, that, according to the conditions here, then they don't have an advocate. It's as simple as that. They love to point out passages like this. They don't have an advocate according to this passage. So not only do, do they not have forgiveness for any sins they do while claiming to be a sinless perfectionist, they don't have any forgiveness for any sins they have ever committed because they don't meet the condition, right? So that brings us to the end of our study on the first part of 1 John. Uh, there's more to unpack in the second chapter in our next study about the commandments, etc. But we, we fundamentally see how simple John's language really is. Either we say that we have not sinned or we have no sin and we deceive ourselves and we do not meet the condition to have a, an advocate and a propitiation and we walk in darkness. Or we confess and that admit that we do or admit that we have sin not not that we're trying to do it or not that we're trying to justify it but we know that we have an advocate okay we know that we are forgiven not because of our own obedience or repentance from that sin but because god is faithful and his son jesus is the righteous propitiation and therefore that's why we walk in the light okay so um, I hope that helped you and, uh, you know, I'll be working on the study material for chapter two and we'll delve into uh, the sort of meaning of, you know, keep his commandments and what that really means and how John interpreted that. Uh, if you haven't seen my study on John 14 and 15, I think if you go and watch that, it would be a good complimentary study, but they are they are quite long studies though. So um, keep your eye out for the second chapter study coming soon in a few weeks time.